What's going on guys, Ted from Nerd Immersion here, and I'm back with another Unlocked Arcana review. Sorry this one is about a week or so too late compared to when it actually came out, but if I'm being completely honest, I was just not motivated to make this video. Uh, and there's nothing against this Unlocked Arcana specifically, um, but the content did kind of, that is sort of my driving factor on these. And I don't want to discourage the... Uh, creation of additional unearthed arcana that is not just magic items or not just feats or not just subclasses or races or things like that because obviously we all know myself and i'm sure all of you those are the ones that everybody's the most excited about uh we get to see and it seems like for more often than not that's the stuff that actually makes it into the books so we already know that tiefling sub races and gith and the, the sub races of gith are what are going to make it into morgan Kanan's tome of foes that comes out just in a little bit here in may uh and those we saw in unearthed arcana so some of these other ones are kind of wonky uh again we like to see feats and whatnot but this was a weird one so this was called unearthed arcana into the wild uh, and I didn't really think that this was necessary. Some of them I thought, like, the Three Pillar experience and the downtime were warranted, as they added additional aspects, but I didn't really think this was needed. And that's really why it's taken me this long to make the video, because I just couldn't motivate myself enough to do it. So we're gonna try, and we're gonna see what happens. So let us jump over to... Oops, uh, nothing with a camera. So, why don't we attempt to do that here? Um, we'll just shrink you down. Sorry, we got to do this here on the fly. Um, oh, and we're grabbing the wrong Chrome window. Great. Um, let's try that again. Here we go. Sorry, I could cut that, but I don't know. Now it's real, and uh, you guys get to see the experience as it happened. So here it is. Uh, the links to this will be in the description as always. This month, on Arctic Arcana wanders into the wilderness with new ways to approach outdoor exploration. Later this month, the survey will be released. That's as per normal. So here it is. It's five pages, and it's just essentially random encounter tables and like ways to handle traversing through the forest and the outdoors. Maybe maybe I'll use this in my games. It's possible. Um, but, like, it took me three tries to finish this just because I just was not that interested. But, let's try to do it together, see what we come up with. So, Wilderness Travel Rules in Chapter 5 of the Dungeon Master's Guide, Chapter 8 of the Player's Handbook, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and it just basically goes through, this takes a way to, pro uh, provides a new overlay for those existing rules. So, it's broken down into four different phases. Choose a Wilderness travel phases are choose a destination, choose activities, resolve activities and travel, and camp. So, uh, most of those are self-explanatory, but let's read through them here. Choose destinations. Before the party's traveling, they gotta pick where they wanna go. Uh, a destination can be a place the party can reach that same day, or one that requires multiple days of travel. If they wanna wander an area without a specific destination, use the standard rules for wilderness travel contained within the existing books, Dungeon Master Guide Player's Handbook. Navigation DC. These rules include a new concept called the Navigation DC. Um, sometimes things can be found easily, sometimes they're a little more difficult, and that depends on the scenario. So basically, uh, I believe it's a survival check. Uh, some locations might be difficult. Reaching an intense uh, visible tower floating in the air might require a special magic item, or a mundane location is hidden within a thick way. Uh, they can make a roll against the Navigation check to see if they locate it. So I actually don't think it says that it's a survival check. It just says what this DC is. I thought I remember reading that. Um, I guess not. Well, anyway, here's the DCs. So you can see this. I'm assuming these are survival checks. So you see with none, destination uh, has a clear road, trail, or well-marked path leading to it. This would probably be like you're heading from down the road to a nearby city. The DC would be zero. And you can see it increases over time to a 30 which the destination is hidden using powerful magic such as a regional effect that causes the forest trees to slowly shift and force characters onto the wrong path. Choose activities. Each player undergoes an activity while traveling, choosing from one of the uh, from among the options offered in Chapter 8 of the Player's Handbook, um, but with one modification. In any case, where the destination has a navigation DC, at least one character must choose to navigate in order to give the party a chance to reach its destination. So I just happen to have my player's handbook here in front of me 
So let's go ahead and look. We're in chapter eight. Uh, so it says, choose from one of the options. So uh, I'm looking at it and I'm trying to figure out what they are. Oh, it looks like other activity. Oh, we have navigate, draw a map, track, and forage. Those seem to be the options. For those of you curious, this is page 183 of the Dungeon Master Guide under activity while traveling. Other activities. So under activities while traveling, you have marching order, stealth, noticing threats, and then other activities. And that has navigate, draw map, track, and forage. So we'll just keep this here in front of me just in case we need to reference it again. So other than this, with Navigation DC, someone has to make that roll is what it says here. Resolve activities and travel. Uh, using rules, set a, single, uh, set a single set of ability checks for each character's activities for that day's worth of travel. Navigation, okay, so this is where it says it is a survival DC, applying normal modifiers for the party's travel piece and other factors. With a successful check, the characters make progress towards their destination, perhaps even reaching it if it's a shorter destination again against this table up here. Um, if they fail, they make, uh, or if no character makes a check when the destination has a navigation DC, the party becomes lost. Then there's a section on becoming lost. Roll on the becoming lost table. If the result uh, would be impossible, such as requiring the characters to travel farther than they can eat in a day, just pick a point between the character's starting point and where they intended and have that happen. So if they roll a 1 to 4, they are 2d6 miles in a random direction from the destination. Or 5 or 6, this is rolling a d6. After traveling in circles and 1d6 miles in a random direction from the starting point. Then it has random encounters. While traveling, use uh, the random encounter guidelines in the Dungeon Master Guide as an optional rule for when the characters are lost. Roll twice for each random encounter check to reflect what monsters or characters might blunder into a monster lair or other unusual threat. Travel. After determining if a group becomes lost or has a random encounter, check your map to determine the character's route during the day. From their starting location, track how far they travel toward their destination. Narrate any changes in terrain. Special locations characters find along the way. There's a whole section on describing the wilds. In the same way that a map and an encounter key describe a dungeon, the wilderness can be summarized with a hex map and a collection of interesting features. So, now we have a whole section here on mapping the wilderness. Uh, there's stuff on mapping in the Dungeon Master's Guide. Um, it's a good idea to map out an area that the party can cover in a day or two of travel uh, to allow your design to bring out the details of each area. Uh, when creating wilderness, take the time to think about the mood. Is it hot? Is it uh, is there lava? Forest, uh, fortress spire built by a god. Take time to think about what creatures would be there um, and why. Uh, what would happen? Are our characters moving through a war-torn land or something being patrolled? Um, pay special attention to friendly settlements and roads. The ease of movement uh, roads provide and the promise of a safe haven make well-traveled and settled areas attractive to most characters, especially at low level. Uh, adventure locations. Uh, assign navigation DCs to you know potential interest spots on your map. Take into account the creatures that dwell nearby, their nets notoriety, and things of that nature. Regional effects. Reviewing the monsters that lair in your wilderness. Uh, basically what this means is certain high-level monsters provide regional effects. Like um, I don't believe it has a specific one listed, but uh, regional effects are a great tool for showing the player how the presence of a powerful creature can alter the environment. They also add an element of magic and strangeness. So this could be something like a uh, white dragon making it snowy or, or something of that nature. Uh, determine checks and DCs. Take note of the DCs needed to forage in an area, uh, but also think about DCs for any other ability checks that happen in that region. An ability check you call for might be a part of an existing activity or it might be a special activity relevant to this given area. In any case, check for uh, asking for special checks can help drive home a region's unique character and dangers. And it has a couple of lists here. Athletics. You might require characters to attempt athletic checks to navigate around difficult terrain or broken ground. History. To locate a forgotten road, identify origin of ruins, or find a site that's been abandoned by myth and legend. Nature. To identify what sorts of creatures dwell in the area based on what you see. Stealth. Uh, in areas of heavy patrol. Uh, or uh, to watch out for a specific creature, um, or survival, to allow characters to avoid gathering and eating poisonous plants, to spot quicksand and hazards, and to avoid paths or areas where dangerous creatures prowl. Okay. Tactical terrain. We're almost done, folks. 
As a final tool, and I do agree with this part, and I think this is something that can vary combat quite a bit uh, if you're unfamiliar. And again, I would, I, I'm not saying don't use this, especially if you're designing a new campaign or a new area from the ground up, this may prove to be quite useful to you. And in that case, it's a great resource to have it's just a lot of us, myself included, feel like when we see Unearth Arcana releasing, we're very excited to go see what new class options we're going to get. And possibly some of this is reduced due to the Mike Merle's Happy Fun Hour on Mondays where he kind of starts to work on other classes. But uh, either way. So uh, but basically the way to vary combat and stuff is to add tactical terrain. A random table filled with iconic terrain for an area can help inspire you in the moment and ensure that the interesting key elements of a region remain part of the action. Start off with at least one or two noteworthy features that are always present. Then think of a few simple but distinctive features that you expect to find in specific areas. If flat grasslands are the dominant feature, you might also have low hills, ruins, watering holes, thorny bushes, etc. Once you're done, create a list of all the terrain features and assign each one a percentage chance to be present in an area, including 100% for dominant features. Then create an encounter, you can add these in. So then we have a one sample encounter. This is the Moon Hills in the Nentir Vale region. Uh, patrols from Fallcrest keep uh, the area's organized threats in check, uh, but monsters often make forays from the Cloakwood. Strange creatures draw from the Feywild, the Shadowfell, and the Elemental Plane of Earth. So we have two pages basically of this. So sample region, I'm sorry, it's not a sample encounter, it's a whole region, so basically incorporates everything we talked about. Ambient mood, the hills are steep and sharp with jagged escarpments forming sprawling hilly plateaus. A small groups dot the area, as do the occasional burial mound watchtowers from the ancient Sauron Kel and other ruins. And here's some other interesting features. Uh, play up the hill in the jagged cliff faces, making travel through this area and like navigating a maze. Random boulders are common in the area, placed by influence of elemental earth. Uh, and looking as though they were dropped from the sky, so that adds some cover and things to your area. The area's key hook is the presence of many crossings to the Feywild and Shadowfell. Uh, various minotaurs appear. Distorted topography of the Moon Hills is due in part to the influence of earth magic. Uh, plenty of farms and manor houses are found in the area, owing to its proximity to Fallcrest. Trails, old fences, of uh, wood or stone, property markers. Several druids are active in the area, drawn by the ambient planar energy. Though rocky, the soil of the Moon Hill is bountiful, is part uh, because of the length of the Feywild and the plane of element, the plane of Earth. The maze-like nature of this land promises lots of hidden areas and sudden discoveries. And a variety of terrain and features, making travel in the Moon Hill challenging. Any experienced traveler can attempt to navigate. Blah blah blah. Settlements. An attack on any of the farms or manors in the Moon Hills draws the notice of travelers or locals within a day or two. While the area has its secrets, the country is civilized overall. Ruins and dungeons. Megaliths have been raised by the druid with tunnels and chambers excavated beneath them. Um, ruined watchtowers and small forts built up by Sauron Minotaurs. Dot the landscape. A few abandoned farmhouses and manors surround the hills. They are leg they these are the legacy of raids that took place uh, back in the day. Undiscovered vaults of Sauron Kel are still hidden and an earth cult might establish a hidden base. So a couple options to add uh, to put in encounters if you need them. And then here's a section on in uh, exploration. So, navigation. The steep hills and the winding paths between them can be confusing, but the sparse vegetation of the hills allows clear view of the sky. If the characters are off the roads or paths that wind through the area, they must navigate to avoid becoming lost, even if their destination does not normally require a check. In that case, the DC is 10. Forging DC is 10. Water and light game are plentiful, and special rules that the character gets a long rest here roll on the planar confluence table. So here's navigation. The characters are seeking a specific location on the table. Have them you know, have them roll on the navigation. If they become lost, they must make a check to navigate to a destination, even if the map, uh, even if they have a map or know the path from having made a prior visit. And you can see the larger things like Fall Crest are no DC, and then the Lost Gate of the Laughing Path is the highest thing, the hardest thing to find, which is a uh, 30 DC. Planar Confluence. This is a specific thing to this area. Whenever they complete a long rest, roll a d20 and consult the table. 1 to 16, nothing happens. One, 17 and 18, Shadowfell influence causes nightmares or disturbing visions. Only get half hit dice back. 19, Feywild influence grants visitors exciting dreams and you get uh, inspiration. And 20 is Earth influence fortifies and strength of flesh and bones. They gain temporary hit points equal to their character level. And lastly, we have our terrain piece. 
Uh, steep slopes have a well planned, uh, favor a well planned attack. Bandits intelligent monsters prefer to, uh, prefer to open an assault with missile fire uh, from above. Blah, blah, blah. So here's your tactical terrain that we discussed. You can roll on this table. 100% 1d3 plus 1 steep hills. Um, 100% 2d4 plus 2 scattered trees. 25% boulder field. 10% uh, rune watchtower. 5% shadow felt influence. Disadvantage on death saves. Uh, and Feywild influence. Disadvantage on wisdom saves. And that's it. I do appreciate that they gave us a full... Uh, sample region to kind of showcase what they were talking about as some of that stuff seemed kind of ethereal and you might not know what they meant when they said oh do this or do that so a full-blown example is a nice thing to help clarify what is what but again at the end of the day I'm still not certain how necessary this was I'm curious what you guys think what were your thoughts on this month's Unearthed Arcana was it basically like I waited a whole month for this or are you genuinely excited about these new wilderness travel rules uh, maybe I'm in the minority that, uh, I thought this was sort of unnecessary. Although, again, I can see certain aspects of it making its way into my game. So, anyway, guys, sorry there's been a lot less D&D videos like this on the channel. I'm working to get back into it. Um, I just had a lot going on lately, uh, at home. So, it's been, uh, a little rough to find the time to make the videos. Um, but I'm hoping to rectify that soon. So, anyway, guys, hope you enjoyed the video, and I'll see you next time. Oh,